Oma Gyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tesmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namaham Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namene Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Panchakaupata Rupyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaye Vacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so we welcome everyone to our study of Srimad Bhagavatam at the level of Bhakti Vai Bhav and we're on canto number six and we're in chapter number 16 which is entitled King Chitraketu meets the Supreme Lord. And so in the last class we began uh, part of chapter 16 and we heard how Narada and Angira well primarily I guess prima, primarily Narada brought the dead child back to life Chitraketu's son was brought back to life and spoke in lightning words for the benefit of Maharaj Chitraketu and his wife and all the relatives and all the servants who were there in the palace. They all heard the child speak and when he was asked why he's leaving his mother and father, he said, who's my mother and father? He said, these people are not my mother and father. I've had many mothers and fathers, but my real father is the Supreme Lord, the father of everyone. So Narada Muni arranged for this child to speak in lightning words and with the child speaking about the nature of life and the nature of uh, birth and death in the material world and how it's inevitable for everyone but the soul never dies and then everyone became enlightened and even the women who had given poison to the child they confessed their sins and they went to do atonement and Chitraketu Maharaj he also went to take bath in the Yamuna and he came back and Narada Muni gave him the mantra, gave him this wonderful mantra which we heard within seven nights he'd be able to see the Supreme Lord. So this is where we're beginning today. We're up to about chat about text number, uh, text is it? Uh, 19 or 18 where Narada Muni begins to give the mantra to Maharaj Chitraketu and it's a Vasudev mantra Vishnu mantra Vasudev and Sankarshana and Iruda Prajumna are mentioned the mantra itself covers I think seven verses or nine verses is it Anyway, it's quite a long mantra and we're told the mantra represents 
Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan. The three different features of the Absolute Truth are all described. So Narada and Angira were very pleased with Chitraketu and they gave him the mantra and they taught him how to chant and Maharaj Chitraketu took the chanting of the mantra very seriously and we're told how he was fasting. We need to, we always have to encourage devotees in our Krishna consciousness movement. We try to encourage them also in their chanting. We want them to, you know, chant without uh, looking at their handphones. <laughs> Difficult for them. Difficult to get people to put down their handphone for even a little while to do japa. Difficult for people to focus only on the holy name just for two hours in the day. But here we have Chitraketu. He was really into the chanting. He took it very seriously. And uh, we're, told, it, we're told how fasting and drinking only water, Chitraketu for one week, continuously chanted with great care and attention the mantra given by Narada Muni. That's text number 27. So you can see he was really a very serious devotee. We want to also focus on our chanting, our japa. Tomorrow is a Ekadasi. It's always good for us to do more chanting on a Ekadasi and some kind of fasting, some level of fasting. At least a Ekadasi fasting should be there. No grains, no beans. these kind of things, they help us to put more attention into the chanting of the Holy Name. So this Chitraketu Maharaj was very serious, and you, you could imagine. Not an easy thing to do, fasting and drinking only water for one week. We are supposed to also learn to control the tongue. I remember Prabhupada telling his servant Prajumna, Prajumna was his Sanskrit editor and he told Prajumna, he said, fasting is necessary for spiritual life. We don't put a great emphasis on fasting but some degree of fasting has to be there. Don't eat too much, and especially on a courtesy, don't eat grains and beans. Regu regulation has to be there. I, I'm giving class. So Chitraketu for one week, he followed this principle, maybe sometimes we can also try it like that, do one week, <laughs> do more, put more emphasis on chanting. Of course people do it often in the month of Kartik, it's a good time during Kartik, more chanting, less eating. Sometimes at the end of Kartik also Bhisma Panchak is there, Bhisma Panchak, you know, some people eat only Ekadasi Prasadam and some people do much more than just, they eat even less than Ekadasi Prasadam, 
They don't eat any grains. Some people, I, I remember one time we did Bhisma Panchak. I was in Vrindavan and we were doing it. Indra was there at that time. Indra, the famous Kirtaniya. And we began the first day, they kind of say full fast, near job. The second day, we just take cow urine. So you don't drink much cow urine. You take cow urine and water. The third day, you take cow dung and water. <laughs> cow dung. How much cow dung are you going to eat? And the, the fourth day, you take, uh, what was it, water and ghee. And then the fifth day, you take some milk and water. And fifth evening, you break fast. That's the Bhisma Panchak. That's the, 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 the most severe form of Bhisma Panchak. Different levels. Prabhupada said, fasting is for spiritual advancement. But it, it's not so important. What is important is to increase our chanting. That's the main thing. We don't want to sacrifice our chanting for the sake of fasting. So chanting and, and doing service for Krishna is much more important than fasting. So we don't sacrifice devotional service just because we're weak from fasting. If fasting means we have to sleep all day, then it's no good. We have to be, we have to be there to chant. Okay, anyway, so Chitra Ketu, for one week he was doing this, and then we're told, text number 28 goes on and describes Chitra Ketu has achieved the rule of the planet of the Vijadharas as an intermediate product of his spiritual advancement in knowledge. So Prabhupada explains it, he said, uh, a devotee can get any kind of material result by doing devotional service. Devotional service alone is competent to award a devotee all material power. But a pure devotee is never attached to material power. So we could, we, it's a, an incredible. After one week, he became, he, he became the ruler of the planet of the Vijadharas. Of course, we may say, we don't want to leave. Oh, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave my family. <laughs> Chitra Ketu didn't, he didn't have any problem like that because he'd already been enlightened about the nature of family life. If we were put into that situation, we'd say, I don't want to, I, don't, I can't leave my family, I can't leave my relatives, I can't leave my home. But Chitraketu was fully enlightened, he had become detached from everything material. So the Vijadara is a, a, a heavenly planet, like on the level of the Gandharvas, Gandharva Loka, Vijadara Loka. They're very good in Kirtan, they can sing very nicely, very melodious. So Chitraketu um, Chitra Maharaj became a ruler there. But Pr Prabhupada explains, he said, this side benefit of his devotional service, which he rigidly performed in accordance with the instructions of Narada. So this is only the side benefit. This is not what a devotee is interested in, just to get some material recognition, material position that is not desirable for the world. We know, of course, Dhruva Maharaj, he got a king, he got, you know, in the, in the beginning, he was looking to get a kingdom. 
He wanted to get a kingdom greater than Lord Brahma. And he got it, but he regretted it. Hmm. He said, I was, in the beginning I was looking for pieces of broken glass, but I have found the most beautiful jewel. So Dhruva Maharaj actually regretted that he had material desire. So, however, Prabhupada explains, Krishna can give you material things. If they're good for our devotional service, Krishna can arrange to give them. Can you think of some examples? People needed something material, they needed some kind of opulence or some kind of position for the service of Krishna. I mentioned Dhruva Maharaj. Is there any other, some others, some other examples? Hare Krishna. Bali Maharaj also, after he gave uh, charity to Guru Krama, then uh, he got uh, one uh, planet of which is equal to heaven. Bali. After he gave charity to to who? What charity did he get? He gave three steps. Uh, he promised to give three steps of uh, three food steps. Uh huh. So, 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 what did Bali Maharaj get? Bali Maharaj uh, actually he fully surrendered to Krishna. Uh huh. So uh, uh, Krishna he gave uh, full uh, the lower planets. Uh, which is uh, as equivalent as uh, the heaven. Yeah, subterranean, subterranean heavenly planets, yes. Which is the residence of the demons, right? And so Bali Maharaj, Bali Maharaj had to go there and reside there. Okay, so he was given some kind of opulence. Yeah, the, the, the demons, of course, that subterranean heavenly planets is more opulent than heaven, even more opulent than heaven. But that is, it means, simply means more bewildering. Material opulence is bewildering. Anyway, okay, thank you, Bali Maharaj. Got some opulence. Not exactly what he wanted, but <laughs> it was put there anyway. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Sudama Vipra. Oh, Sudama Vipra, yes. Very interesting example, right? Can you tell us? Um, actually, he is a very poor Brahmana and also he is a classmate of uh, Krishna and Balaram and they were studying in Sandipani Muniyashram uh -huh. and uh, his wife uh, tells uh, Sudama to go to Krishna uh, and get the um, opulence, wealth from Krishna. And so he goes to Dwaraka. Uh, when he goes to Dwaraka, Krishna himself comes out and uh, do a very grand reception welcoming him. Then he, Krishna himself washes his feet. I mean, even before he asks anything, uh, he gets all the opulence. So, which he had taken only a handful of, of uh, flattened rice to give it to Krishna and he is very hesitant to give it to him. Uh, but Krishna can understand that and he takes the flattened rice and without even asking, uh, Sudama Vibra get all the wealth uh, which he wanted. Yeah, did, did Sudama want that wealth? No, he didn't want that wealth. He went there because his wife had told him to go and meet Krishna. Yes. Sudama accepted the, that wealth in the mood of renunciation. So quickly he went back. Yes? 
also we find that uh, the fruit vendor got so much of opulence and offered to Krishna. That okay. was very interesting. Okay, yeah, the fruit vendor came to give Krishna the fruits and she got so many jewels, valuable gems in exchange for a few fruit. Yeah, good example. Okay, so we do see sometimes in the course of devotional service we are given opulence. We see devotees for example, in London, devotees, we were, in, 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 in Srila Prabhupada's time, the devotees were living in one rented house in central London, and it was becoming very crowded. And then George Harrison brought, bought, he purchased the, the beautiful Bhaktivedanta Manor for the devotees purchased the place with the beautiful big grounds and, you know, a very, very wonderful place. It was actually a, it, w it was a, a manor, it w really was, a, it, it is a manor and very wealthy people used to live there. So George Harrison purchased it and gave it to Iskon for Prabhupada. So Krishna said, Krishna Maharaj, also Dhruva Maharaj got to rule for 36,000 years. Yes, Dhruva Maharaj <laughs> got stuck in Dhruva Loka for a long time. So we do see a few cases, but it's certainly true that Krishna sometimes gives devotees his opulence. Krishna can provide. Krishna is not a poor man and similarly also at, at, at Juhu temple in Mum, Mumbai, beautiful property there, Prabhupada had the vision to get that property and they built a beautiful temple there and it's so opulent. Right. Yes. Uh, can we also uh, add a kubja? Why? She got a beautiful body. What did she get? She got a beautiful body. Her body was curved. No, oh, her body got straightened by the grace of Krishna. Okay. If we think of it like that, yeah. She was given a different kind of opulence, that her body was straightened by Krishna, Kubja. So if we're going to talk about that kind of opulence, then in Chaitanya Leela also, there's one. Who is it? Vasudevdatta. Not Vasudev Datta, Vasudev. The, the, the leper Vasudev. Yeah, leper Vasudev, yes. yes. Vasudev, that is a, he's a different devotee. Yeah, there are many Vasudevs. <laughs> this is a leper Vasudev. He was transformed. Yeah, Krishna, uh, Lord Chaitanya embraced him and his body became rejuvenated. But the. Br also, uh, Lord Chaitanya embraced. Similarly, Lord Chaitanya embraced Sanatana Goswami. And be cured. Oh, when Sanatan Goswami's body was all infected? Yes. So Lord Chaitanya could transform people, transform their bodies from disease conditions into healthy bodies. The, the leper Vasudev was worried. However, when Lord Chaitanya transformed his body, he thought, now, now it will be easy for me to be a victim of sense gratification. So Lord Chaitanya instructed him, so you have to constantly chant the holy name and you have to preach Krishna consciousness. So if you do these two things, then you won't be affected. If you keep yourself busy in chanting and preaching, then 
You have no time for sense gratification. So that's the solution. So here, anyway, Chitraketu has received position, the rule of a planet. <laughs> And this is just the byproduct of devotional service. It's not very significant. Huh? Devotional service can give much more than just some temporary position in the material world. Even though he's got this position in the material, the ruler of a planet, he'll be, and he can be there for a long time, but still it's it's temporary it's not an eternal position so a devotee is not very much interested in that it's not the goal of life but a devotee can accept whatever position krishna puts him in just as sudama had to accept the opulence given to him by grace of krishna he couldn't reject it krishna had given him but he accepted everything in the mood of renunciation. That is the point. That you have to remember Krishna is the proprietor. And Krishna has put us in this situation and we have to utilize that situation for the service of Krishna. Whatever opulence, whatever good position we have, it's by the grace of Krishna. And if, if we don't have opulence, we don't have big position, that is also the grace of Krishna. And we are thankful to Krishna for that also. Because we think that if I had that big position, maybe it would be detrimental to my Krishna consciousness. Krishna knows what is good for us and he puts us in the right position for our spiritual advancement. So we should think like that. Okay, so we're told about how Chitraketu, within a very few days, by the influence of the mantra, Chitraketu's mind became increasingly enlightened in spiritual progress and he attained shelter at the lotus feet of Ananta Dev. So Lord Ananta Dev, Ananta Dev means also Sankarshan or Ananta Shesha, different names for the one personality. So this mantra apparently which he was chanting was bringing him to the shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Ananta Dev. So that is what we really want from the mantra. We want to get the shelter of the Lord. It's not that we want opulence or any kind of material blessings, but if we can get the shelter, if we can get to Take our, fix our mind on the, on the Lord, then that is the real goal of chanting a mantra. So probably, Maharaj, I have a, yes, sorry. you have a question, Maharaji? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, I just wanted to understand at what stage of our Krishna consciousness, Krishna takes the charge of our life and we are uh, not under the law of karma and Krishna has taken just by uh, taking chanting or uh, initiation or becoming very serious or at what stage Krishna completely takes the charge of the like uh, of a devotee and we are just Krishna only decides Krishna anyway is deciding every time but but what stage he completely takes charge well when we surrender, surrender. When we fully surrender to Krishna, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, right? As you surrender to me, I reward you accordingly. Now, it's not just only taking initiation, but it depends also on our attitude when we take initiation. Now, different people will take initiation in a different manner, in different 
with a different attitude. But if we're actually surrendering ourselves to Krishna, we're really taking shelter of Krishna and we just want to commit fully to the service of Krishna, then at that point, then Krishna can take interest. But you know, we cannot force Krishna. Krishna is watching us, he knows. He's watching all of us and he knows where, where we stand, what is our position in Krishna consciousness. He knows how serious we are, how much dedicated we are. Okay, I was going to read a, a little bit here from Prabhupada's purport in this uh, verse number uh, 29 here. Nothing in devotional service is material. Everything is spiritual. Consequently, a devotee is awarded so-called material opulence for spiritual advancement. This opulence is an aid to help the devotee advance towards the spiritual kingdom. Thus Maharaj Chitraketu remained in material opulence as a Vijadhara Pati, master of the Vijadharas, and by executing devotional service he became perfect within a very few days and returned home back to Godhead taking shelter at the lotus feet of Lord Shesha Ananta. So, <laughs> it's surprising to read that the opulence, that opulence is an aid to their devotional service. How would people use opulence in devotional service? You want to give some examples? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, by constructing temples, giving money to construct temples. Yes, right. Giving money to construct the temples like the TOVP, which is under construction. People give money, they give a lot of money to construct that temple. So that is one way. Any other opulence you could use in the service of Krishna? Donating okay. Lakshmi to a book printing Maharaj, like uh, for BBT. Yes, you could use money for book printing also. Also Maharaj, using one's uh, opulence of uh, uh, goodwill to create more and more facilities from different kinds of organizations for the development of preaching and temples and other activities as projects. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But not, not just only using money. What about other kinds of opulence? Maybe somebody has fame or somebody has education or somebody has good looks like that. How will you use this in, in the service of Krishna? Yes. Uh, Maharaj, uh, uh, Krishna uh, given talent, you know, like uh, maybe he is good in preaching, uh, maybe he is uh, good in uh, Kirtan, so we can uh, do this service to the Lord in a very operate way to please Krishna. Yes. Yes, somebody is maybe very musical, they have great musical talent, they can use that to do nice kirtan, to attract people. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandrat Pranam. Mm -hmm. Maharaj, uh, when we went to Hungary temple, we saw one Mataji, uh, she was, she was uh, painting the wall. So, you know, there is no sketch, there is no uh, rush paint, but directly she is painting. So, she was, you know, we were amazed to see and then she said, uh, Krishna wanted, she's, Krishna gave me this, so I am using my talent in Krishna's service. So, I am painting this uh, temple wall. 
She was painting a picture of Krishna on the wall, was it? No, on the wall. She was decorating the wall. What, with, the, with, the with the pastime of Lord Krishna or something? Yes, yes. Oh, oh wonderful. Hmm. Yeah, very So, good. opulent can be of any uh, nature, but if we are using it for Krishna and in devotion or uh, bringing, uh, you know, souls into movement, uh, all those are, you know, uh, good ones, isn't it, Manaj? Yes, yes, very good. Very good. Yes. Yeah. Somebody is very famous, just like Maharaj Chitraketu, you know, he's a king and he became the king of, of the planet, of the Vijadharas. And so, it's a big position in the universe, quite important, right? You get a big position. So, use that position for the service of Krishna, to influence people, to do bhakti to take up devotional service. Maharaj, sometimes even when people, they are very politically well connected, they help us to get permissions and things like that because of their political connections. Yes, right. That's a good example. We need the support, right? And what was the devotee was saying, we wanted to bring the President of America and the Queen of England, they were going to bring them to Mayapur. And Prabhupada, he said to Prabhupada, we will bring the President of America and the Queen of England, we will bring them to Mayapur for the opening of the new temple. And Prabhupada said, if you do that, Bhaktivinoda Thakur will come from the spiritual world and take you back to Godhead. <laughs> so, Prabhupada was encouraging the devotee, if you can do this, it's very good. Very good because you attract a lot of attention. You attract these very important, very prominent people in the world. And if you can attract them to come to Mayapur, then so many other people will, will also want to come. And they'll want to also know about Mayapur and see the glory of the Holy Dham. So definitely, we can use opulence in the service of Krishna. We have to be, however, cautious. Don't get proud, don't become contaminated, don't think, don't become bewildered. As it says in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Bhogaishvarya prasaktanam tayaparata chetasam. In the minds of those who are attached to material opulence and sense gratification, and who are bewildered by such things, then the resolute determination for devotional service will not take place. So, this is the problem. If you get too much attached to material opulence. Mm. Prabhupada said, a karmi's material opulence and a devotee's material opulence are not on the same level. <laughs> Right? Prabhupada often would talk about how the neighbors in Los Angeles, they would be envious of the devotees because in Los Angeles they had a nice center and there was a lot of people there. Uh, they were doing a lot of preaching work and they had many cars. You know life in America is like in the Middle East there. Uh, there's, you need cars. Everybody has cars. And so cars are also quite cheap there. And the neighbors were just amazed to see all the cars which the devotees would have there. And how they were, they were having so many programs and people were coming and they were feeding them not very nice food, better food than ordinary people eat. And Prabhupada was explaining how every month we are spending so much to maintain this temple. He said the neighbors are amazed. How is it we could be so opulent? And Prabhupada would tell the neighbors, he said, you can come and also stay, you also join us. <laughs> but of course they wouldn't join. But Prabhupada said, Krishna provides for the devotees. Krishna takes care. So many centers around the world, who is providing? Krishna is providing. So that is... Krishna's 
management to take care of the devotees, to look after their needs. When they're sincerely desiring to serve Krishna, Krishna wants to help and facilitate to encourage the devotees. Okay, so Maharaj Chitraketu is very fortunate. He is able to get the darshan of the Supreme Lord. And text number 30 describes how Lord Ananta appears, that he just appears. We don't, we don't know where he came from or what, but the, the Lord just comes, right? He, somehow he, he, he just manifests himself in the presence of Chitraketu. And so he's described as white, as white as the white fibers of a lotus flower, dressed in bluish garments and adorned with a brilliant helmet, armlets, belt, bangles, faces smiling, eyes reddish, and surrounded by such exalted, liberated persons as Sanat Kumar. So Lord Ananta Shesha has appeared, and Maharaj Chitraketu sees the Lord, and just by seeing the Lord, he becomes purified. He's cleansed of all contamination. Of course, he must have al already been very purified because he chanted the mantra for, and then he became the king of the Vijadharas. So he must have been very pure. But he becomes fully purified, completely purified. And we're told also he was situated in his original Krishna consciousness, being completely purified. So does he immediately begin to offer prayers? What does he do? How does he react seeing Lord, the Lord, seeing Lord Ananta Shesha? What's he going to do? Anyone? What do you do when the Lord appears to you? Okay. Yeah. He became silent and grim, and then he offered prayer to the Lord. Yeah. At first, at first he cannot speak, right? Because it's so, oh, you know, he's so overwhelmed with love and with devotion, the ecstasy that the Lord, because he'd been chanting the glories of the Lord, and 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 now, yes. First thing, we don't believe our fortune. We could see the of the Lord. Yes, right. Couldn't believe. We're so fortunate. When it actually happens, you know, what will we think? Could we imagine? Not so easy thing that when the Lord suddenly appears, Lord Ananta Shesha, Lord Ananta Shesha with all of his hoods and with all the liberated souls, certainly it must have been quite a, an, a, an event to actually see the Lord like that, even if you are the king of the Vijadharas, but to see Lord Ananta Shesha, whoa, that's very powerful. And in the purport, Prabhupada talks about just like visiting the temple, seeing the deity. If you go regularly, then you get so purified. So Chitraketu Maharaj, he's just seeing the Lord, when the Lord is appearing to him. But Prabhupada said, you go to the temple, if you go regularly and you see the Lord, it's very powerful, very purifying. Every day you want to go and see the deities, have deities. Of course, many people, with, maybe you keep the deity in your home, you have your own altars, you do your own temple worship there. But it, it, we should develop that mood that this is a program, that we have to do this. Like we, every morning we have a morning program, we do, go to see the Lord. 
And without seeing the deity, then if you don't get darshan, then we don't take prasadam. Prabhupada would talk about uh, is it, uh, that family in Kanpur, Singhania, is it? JK? Right? Anybody from Kanpur? In Kanpur there was this one family, I think, J.K. Singhania. So they, they're, they're, devote, they're, they're worshippers of Lord Krishna. And so they have the deity, they have the temple in their house. And the custom is, every day, everyone has to come and see the deity and have darshan. And if they don't go to temple and have darshan, then there will be a fine. They have to pay a fine. The pujari has that duty that he's to keep a record of all the members in the family. And if anybody doesn't come to see the deity, they pay the fine. And he will come and he will collect the fine from them. <laughs> so that's a good system. Similarly in our temple sometimes, you know, they, they keep a track who, because many brahmacharis and Sometimes they, they're lazy, they don't get up in the morning, so they keep a check, make sure who's coming, who's not coming. If they don't come, they're not something wrong. What's, what's wrong? This guy is not coming. And there's a pastime also. The one man used to come to see Lord Rama every day, Lord Ramachandra, when he was present in Ayodhya. The one brahmana would come to see Lord Rama every day and offer obeisances and then only he would eat. And if he didn't see Lord Rama, he would fast. And sometimes Lord Rama would go out on, on visit to travel in the kingdom. And so if the man did not see Lord Rama, he would fast. And Lord Rama would be away for several days and the man would fast for several days. So Lord Rama heard how this brahmana is fasting when he's away from the kingdom. So Lord Rama gave him the deity, he gave him the de his own deity and he told him, you worship this deity. He said, when I'm away, you just offer obeisances to the deity and then you take prasadam. He said, you don't need to fast every day, yeah, and you just worship the deity. So that deity of Lord Ramachandra is still worshipped today. It's passed down since the times of Lord Rama. It was, it was given to, I think, uh, Madhvacharya and it's there in Udupi. So anyway, going to see the Lord, that's his idea. Maharaj Chitrakito meets Lord Ananta Shesha and we're told how he begins to offer prayers, but not immediately because his voice is choked with ecstasy. He was unable to speak. So he has to wait for a little while, but he controls his mind and intelligence and then he begins to express his feelings. In text number 33, Prabhupada said, Thus he began offering prayers to the Lord, who is the personification of the Holy Scriptures. The Sattvata Samhitas, like the Brahma Samhita and the Narada Pancharatra, and who is the spiritual master of all. He offered his prayers as follows. So then the prayers begin in text 34. And there's about 15 verses of prayers and Maharaj Chitraketu is describing, first of all, text 34, he says, The Lord and the devotee both conquer, Prabhupada writes. Maharaj Chitraketu has said like that, he said, uh, you, he said, you cannot be conquered by anyone. And then he said, you are certainly conquered by devotees. <laughs> he said, you, although you cannot be conquered by anyone, you are certainly conquered by devotees who have control of their mind and senses. Could someone explain how the Lord is conquered? 
And how does how do the devotees conquer the Lord? Anyone? How, how is it possible to conquer the Supreme Lord? Hare Krishna Maharaj, by love, with the unalloyed devotion, with, the love, with love only we can conquer the Lord. Uh -huh. Yes. Do you know any, you, you know any verse like this where Krishna says he's conquered by the devotee? Yeah. Can you give me the translation? Where is it from? And uh, this is from um, Maharaja Ambarisha uh, prays. Uh, Yes. Yeah, so I am uh, not uh, um, by the. Uh, I am bound by the devotees, and I am not free. I don't have freedom from. Uh, so I am not independent uh, because I am bound by the love of the devotees. Okay. Bound by Krishna is bound by the love of his devotees. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Can we say that uh, verse, Maharaj, Jnane Prayasa Udapashana Mantra Eva? Yes, right. That's the one I was thinking of. Yes. Jita Jito Piya Sita Istrilokyam, right? Krishna is a Jita. He's unconquered. But he becomes conquered by the devotees. Why? What do the devotees do? Nanda Kishore? Uh, they, the Lord. Yes. Yeah, they, they, they conquer the Lord by hearing about Him in the association of devotees. Simply by hearing, remaining, remain in whatever position you're there in, and simply hear about the Lord in the association of devotees. In this way, they conquer Him. And how does Krishna conquer the devotees? Anybody? How does Krishna conquer the devotees? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Yeah, till morning we were thinking about the Bilva Mangata was um, Chora Agraganyams. Huh? What's Prajaya it? Prasiddham Maharaj. Prajaya Prasiddham Navani Pachoram. So uh, when the devotees are very close to him, he will steal everything from them including wealth, everything, to, to make us more attached to Him. How does He make us more attached to Him? He takes away the thing, material positions from us. Or oh, He takes and, everything uh, away? Yes, impurities from us, He takes everything from us, which is not conducive for the devotion. Oh, okay. Yes. Krishna says, when I'm very merciful, <laughs> I take everything away, we become helpless. In that helpless condition, we surrender to Krishna. Yeah, Krishna says, Bhagavad Gita, surrender to me. Give up all your material religion. Give up everything, just take shelter of me. So Krishna is saying like that. So Krishna conquers us. We have to surrender everything for him. So th this first verse, this is pure devotion. In these prayers, this first verse is about pure devotion. But then... Yeah. Uh, in the purple, Prabhupada also talks about the mood in serving, that how, how the devotee doesn't desire anything, Prabhupada writes in the book, because they serve the Lord without desires for remuneration, they can conquer the mercy of the Lord. 
So this is the mood of the devotee. They conquer the Lord because they're desiring to, they just want service. They're not thinking what they'll get. And the Lord is very merciful. And when he sees that his servants are working without desire for material profit, naturally he is conquered. He sees that the, the devotees have given up everything for him. So this conquers that mood of sacrifice by the devotee. It conquers the Lord. And the Lord conquers the devotees because he tells them surrender. <laughs> and some, as Maharaji said, sometimes he takes everything away, forces devotees to surrender, to surrender more. So then, The prayers go on like this, speaking about uh, surrendering to the Lord, recognizing the Lord as the Supreme, distinct from the living entities. The, the, the living entity should understand he's not the Lord, and we're just very small and insignificant in comparison to the Lord. understanding everything in the material world to belong to Krishna. Nothing is actually ours. And we, the, the, the Maharaj Chitraketu talks about the three phases of time the creation, the maintenance and destruction, that in everything the Lord is present. Nothing is due to us, it's all just simply due to the Lord. He talks about how the universe, each universe is covered by so many different layers, And each layer is ten times bigger than the other layer. So you can see the universes are so unlimited. But these universes are just like atoms on the head of Ananta. Right? Each of the universes are resting on the hoods of Ananta Shesha. So Maharaj Chitraketu describes the magnitude of these universes. How oh, they're so huge, but they're resting on the hoods of Ananta Shesha. So, what is the position of Ananta Shesha? These, these, these universes are just like mustard seeds on the head of Ananta Shesha. You know, mustard seeds are so small. Right? We, just, we just had a big field of mustard seeds here in Mayapur. I was watching them harvest the mustard seeds. And the mustard seeds are so small. And so it's a, 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 the, the prayers say, or the, the scriptures tell us, these universes are just like mustard seeds on the hood of Ananta Shesha. So how gigantic Ananta Shesha must be, we cannot begin to understand. And then Maharaj Chitra Ketu talks about how foolish people want sense enjoyment. He said they're no better than animals, although they have the human form. He calls them two-legged animals or human beings. They're human beings, but they're just like animals because their mentality is just Material, they're only thinking about eating and sleeping and mating and defending. They have not understood the real position, the real duty of the human form of life. So then he talks about the benedictions we may get from demigods 
they are insignificant. He says, just like the nobility, when a king is no longer in power. <laughs> so Maharaj Chitraketu, he knows about that. He's a king and he, not, he understands how temporary that position is. So he said, the benedictions you get from a demigod are just like, a, just, they, they, can, they can vanish. Just like a king can be in power one minute, Next minute he's kicked out of power. You can lose everything, can lose all the power. So benedictions from the demigods are like that. They're so temporary. But then 39 is an interesting prayer because Maharaj Chitraketu says that even if you have material desires, if we worship the Lord, then what will happen? Will we get the result of our worship? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes? Uh, we will come to a, a position where we will not have any material desires. Yes. How does it happen? What happened to our material desires? There will be no rebirth. No rebirth? Maharaj, the example given is just like we become sterilized, like how the fried seeds do not produce any plants. Likewise, even though we are in this material world, we do actions, but it doesn't get any reactions. Okay. Yes, that's the example given. Just like seeds, sterilized seeds or fried seeds. Once you, if they're fried, if they've already been fried, you plant them in the ground, nothing going to happen. They're not going to grow. They're already fried. And so, material desires like that. When we come in contact with Krishna, in contact with Krishna, the material desires will gradually diminish. They'll just vanish. If we're fully connected to Krishna and engaged in Krishna's service, even though we came with material desires, we will lose these des desires, right? What are some examples? People with material desires who lost their desires by doing service? Yes. Who? Dhruva Maharaj. Yes. Dhruva Maharaj, that's an obvious example, right? Who else? Diti, Marudgana stories. Diti, Mother Diti. What did she desire? She wants one son who can uh, defeat Indra. Who can defeat Indra? <laughs> yeah. And that, that, then Marutgana appeared, no? Right, yes, right. And it's a nice example, yes. Diti, she wanted a son to defeat Indra. <laughs> but she, what happened? Did she become purified? Yeah, she transferred, her, her heart changed due to Vishnu Puja. <laughs> you know any example? Have you any experience uh, with devotees, our own devotees, people you know? People who came with material desires? We are self-smart. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I was also thinking me. <laughs> Yes? Any other examples? Uh, Maharaj, uh, Harilila Prabhu was mentioning a very uh, good example. He was mentioning that uh, he was traveling from Kolkata to Mayapur to take a flight to go to South India. And when they were on their way to Kolkata, um, Prabhu's son desired that he wanted to eat 
uh, from ISKCON Kolkata because the Prashadam there is very nice. So, uh, but as soon as they reached Kolkata, the traffic jam was quite bad. So, um, they were just two kilometers away from the airport, but they were stuck in a jam because of which they missed their flight. And, <laughs> because, and because they missed their flight, they st- had to stay overnight in ISKCON Kolkata. So they had dinner uh, in Govindas, they had breakfast the next morning, and they had lunch also. So Prue was mentioning that uh, he had a desire to eat. Krishna fulfilled in such a manner that it was so expensive for them, plus they missed all their agenda and their schedules for it. But the desire was fulfilled. <laughs> oh, he said it was very expensive, did he? Uh, yes, yes, it was very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. That was this this morning he mentioned this when he was giving class? Uh, yes, Maharaj, he mentioned when he was giving a class. Okay. <laughs> yes, we have to be careful what we desire. Krishna knows all of our desires. So be careful what we desire. In the purport there, Prabhupada writes, whether for the satisfaction of material desires, because of the influence of envy, because of fear, because of affection, or because of any other reason, if one comes to Krishna, his life is successful. Oh. So because of any other reason, maybe affection, Maybe envy, maybe fear, material desires. But if we come to Krishna, that's the main thing. It's a, it doesn't matter why we came, somehow we're very fortunate that we came to Krishna. Can you think of some anybody like that who came out of fear? I was thinking Gajendra was in distress. It's a type example of here, example here is of Kamsa Maharaj. Kamsa. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but that's not considered pure devotion. True. But certainly he was thinking of Krishna. Sishupal, of course, was envious of Krishna. Okay, then, so text 40 uh, speaks about Bhagavad Dharma. So, 39 was devotional service with material desires. Now, text 40 is describing pure devotion the process of Bhagavad Dharma, about hearing and chanting, right? What is actually Bhagavad Dharma? So you can see the progression in the different in the prayers which Maharaj Chitraketu is offering. He began with pure devotion, but then he got into other things a little bit and then come back. Now he's from devotion with material desires, he's come to pure devotion. And he, he, Prabhupada explains, said, he can understand the difference between life without Bhagavad Dharma and life with Bhagavad Dharma. And thus, he ever remains obliged to the Lord, taking to Krishna consciousness and bringing fallen souls to Krishna consciousness is victory for Lord Krishna. So Prabhupada is talking, is it coming a life without Bhagavad Dharma and a life with Bhagavad Dharma? What, what a difference, you know? Where were we without Srimad Bhagavatam, without the Bhagavad Gita, without Srimad Bhagavatam? How much our life has changed? just by these books and by coming in contact with the scriptures. It's such a big transformation in our life. 
how we utilize our time and how our consciousness is changed, how much, you know, how we're just so much into thinking everything in relation of Srimad Bhagavatam, what does Srimad Bhagavatam say, what does the Bhagavad Gita say, what do the Shastras say. This is Bhagavad Dharma. And what was it like before, before we were devotees, what was it like? You know, it was very, a very different thing. Without Bhagavad Dharma, well, what, what, what was our mentality? What was the life? It was very different. But then text 41 goes on and we hear about the, the, the proper mood for practicing Bhagavad Dharma and how there are other religions which are full of envy and full of irreligion. There's, this is, that, that's not actually Bhagavad Dharma because their business is just simply envy and my religion and your religion and you're different from us. And so what is actually Bhagavad Dharma, the real purpose of Bhagavad Dharma? It's often people don't really know, they don't understand what it means. We, we shouldn't think in terms of my religion or their religion because ultimately Prabhupada said God is one, religion is also one. Religion means to follow the orders of the Supreme Lord, to give up envy and simply engage in his service. That is the real meaning of Bhagavad Dharma. But don't think in terms of my belief or his belief their belief. No. God is one. Don't make it sectarian. We don't want to divide everything. We want to unite the world. Krishna consciousness is to unite the world. So, uh, So this is this is the purpose of Bhagavad Dharma. Prabhupada says in the purport, whereas so-called religions are meant for a particular type of person who believes in a particular way, such discrimination has no place in Krishna consciousness or Bhagavad Dharma. If we scrutinize the religious systems meant for worship of demigods or anyone else but the Supreme Personality of Godhead, we will find that they are full of envy and therefore impure. So this, that's, that's why Srimad Bhagavatam talks about Kaitava Dharma, cheating religions. So the Srimad Bhagavatam completely rejects all these cheating religions, all based upon envy. And so Ch Maharaj Chitra Ketu talks more about this, about how a religion can produce envy, become be envy of one's own self and of others how it causes so much pain in the world, so many problems, and the results that people become angry, and they fight with each other, the history of the world, there's so much fighting and killing. And Prabhupada's purport, he talks about killing different animals and slaughtering animals in the name of religion, that this is also not religion. We're meant to see God in all living entities. And if we simply follow some concoction, then it's not actually a real religion. And there's no benefit. You simply waste your time and give yourself a lot of trouble.
and then takes 43 Maharaj Chitraketu talks about the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Bhagavad Gita although it's not actually mentioned there directly in the Sanskrit but Prabhupada's put it into the translation. If you see the Sanskrit, it talks about in relationship with your instructions and activities. It says Bhagavata, it says Bhagavata, Dharma, religious principles. But Prabhupada directly puts in which Bhagavata and which Dharma is. He says, Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita. We need to have these things. And so this, this verse is about the importance of hearing and people who are civilized, who have good character, they will want to hear these scriptures. So of course our Krishna consciousness movement is meant for promoting the message of all these scriptures. Human society need to hear the spiritual knowledge Prabhupada talks about how this is a killing civilization. So everybody just simply fighting with each other, killing and killing trees and killing animals, and then if the, then it sums also it becomes killing human beings as well. So what kind of civilization is that? Just killing. We don't want that. We want to we want to awaken love of appreciation for other forms of life, not simply killing. Prabhupada says we want to establish a society the way Krishna wants it. He said this is the meaning of Krishna consciousness. We are therefore presenting Bhagavad Gita as it is and kicking out all kinds of mental concoction. So this is Prabhupada's mission, Mudan mission, you can see, get rid of all this nonsense religion, bogus nonsense, and they talk about surrender to Krishna, to surrender to the unborn, unmanifest in Krishna. <laughs> they have no idea what surrender means. So very important that they should be given the opportunity to hear. So then 44 goes on to describe about that. Text 44, Maharaj Chitra Ketu said, It is not impossible for one to be immediately freed from all material contamination by seeing you. Not to speak of seeing you personally, merely by hearing the holy name of your Lordship only once. Even chandalas, men of the lowest class, are freed from all material contamination. Right? Isn't that very similar to a verse in the third canto? Do you remember? Devahuti? Yes, right. Devahuti is a speaking that what to speak of what of uh, the good fortune of one who's directly able to see the Lord, that anybody who simply hears the Lord or hears the glories of the Lord or chants the names of the Lord or remembers the Lord, then even if they're born, they may be born in a low family, but they become qualified to perform a Vedic, a Vedic sacrifice. And they're immediately freed from all their sins. So this is, a, a Jiva Goswami said this verse, this is about the power of hearing the holy name. And he will quote this verse in his commentary. This verse exemplifies the power of hearing, that simply by hearing 
one is immediately purified. There was a discussion in Chaitanya Bhagwat. They were asking, was it Kolaveka Sridhar, why you have to chant so loud? Or sometimes they would ask Haridas Thakur, why you have to chant so loud? The Kolaveka Sridhar would say, who is better, one who can maintain one person or one who can main maintain a hundred? He said, obviously, if I can maintain a hundred people, it's better than just one. So my loud chanting is benefit for everyone. Everyone who hears, they benefit. But if we chant in the mind, who will benefit? Only me. I'm chanting in the mind. It's good for me. Nobody else benefits. But loud chanting, all the living entities benefit. So again, give people the chance to hear. Everyone can be, get, be freed from their sinful reactions simply by hearing. So the holy name is so powerful, even heard once without offense it can purify the lowest of men. So very powerful, very nice verse given to us. And then text 45, Maharaj Chitraketu recognizes the mercy he got, that he got the mantra, he'd been given mercy by Narada Muni. So because of their association, he has, because he was trained by Narada Muni, so he's able to conquer over material attachment and lusty desires. And now he's so fortunate that he's able to directly see Lord Ananta Shesha. So this is the perfection of his spiritual practice. He understood, by the mercy of the spiritual master, you get the mercy of Lord Krishna. You can think of some other examples who also got the instruction from the spiritual master and went on to see God? Dhruva Maharaj. Who? The Dhruva Maharaj. Yes, Dhruva Maharaj got instruction from Narada Muni. Anybody else? Valmiki. Valmiki? Yes. And yes. Nala Kuvera. Nala Kuvera. Mani Griva. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they got the mercy of Narada Muni also, huh? Okay. The, pra the Prachetas. The got the mercy of Lord Shiva. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Even Parishit Maharaj. Parikshit Maharaj, who was his guru? Uh, Shukadeva. Okay. Did he actually see God? He went back to Godhead, no. Oh, he went back to Godhead. No, okay. <laughs> he had to give up the body first to see God, to go and see God. Okay, yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, even Narada Muni got the darshan of the Lord. By the advice of the sages. Yes, yeah, Narada Muni got association with the Bhaktivedantas, the sadhus who came to his house and by their association. In his previous birth, when he was the son of a maidservant, he got their instruction. And so he went on to become, he, he went on to see the Lord, to get darshan of the Lord and to hear the Lord. Just, Next life it became Narada Muni. So the mercy of the spiritual master, by the mercy of the spiritual master, we can get the mercy of Krishna. Very important, very powerful. Hey, Krishna Maharaj, even Shabari got the darshan of Lord Rama. Who was her guru? Uh, Matangarishi. Matangarishi. Tangarishi told her, wait here. 
Just stay here. The Lord is coming. And she waited a long time, right? She was a young woman when he told her. But she waited her whole life. When she was an old lady, then Lord Rama came. Worth waiting for, certainly. Maharaj, even Arjuna, he got instruction from the Lord itself that uh, he had. Okay. Yes. Lord Krishna became his guru and instructed him. All right, so then he goes on to glorify the Lord in the heart that you know everything about the living entities. <laughs> Maharaj Chitraketu said, you know everything, I don't have to tell you anything. <laughs> Why am I telling you, you know everything? You are the creator, maintainer, annihilator. I offer my obeisances. So he recognizes the Supreme Lord. He goes on to glorify the Supreme Lord. And the final verse is text 48. So offering prayers is a devotional activity. This is bhakti yoga, offering prayers. When you see the Lord, you want to be able to offer prayers. We should not. We should be able, we should be able to recite meeting the Lord. Who is Acharya in offering prayers? Who became perfect by offering prayers? Akrura. Akrura, Akrura yes. So, in Nectar of Devotion, it's quoted that uh, uh, the, the the, devote, the devotee's lips are always decorated with prayers to Lord Krishna. And such persons are actually worshipable by the demigods. So we have to, we should try always to recite prayers to glorify the Lord. Of course we chant Hare Krishna mantra. Hare Krishna mantra is also a prayer which we chant is both the prayer and it's also the answer to the prayers. So does Maharaj Chitraketu have any request in his prayers? Is he asking the Lord for anything? Do you notice anything? Did you see any requests there? Anybody? He doesn't have any requests, right? Hare Krishna? Yeah, yes, my request. Yeah, th there's no request. Just like, no just like Lord Brahma, in Brahma Samhita, Lord, Lord Brahma, he's, 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 he's not asking anything either. He's just saying, Govinda Madhipursam, Tamaham Bajami. He doesn't have anything to ask. He's just glorifying the Lord. And so it's, usually we think, We'll pray, we have to get something, we have to ask for something. But Maharaj Chitraketu doesn't ask for anything. He's satisfied, he's fully satisfied. He doesn't have anything to ask. But he still offers prayers. He's got to offer prayers. Sometimes people will tell me, you know, they will say, they, they, they will say, oh, I saw Krishna, I saw Radha and Krishna, I saw, Krishna I, saw, I saw the Lord, He came to me. And so I will ask them, I said, did you offer prayers? I will always ask them, I said, did you, did you remember to offer prayers to the Lord? 
If you saw the Lord, did you bow down to Him? Did you offer your obeisances to Him? Did you offer prayers? <laughs> and you, they'll look at me, you know, they'll think I'm something wrong with me. And, and they'll say, no, I didn't say anything. I think, well, why not? People don't know. If they see the Lord, we're so fortunate that we see the Lord. We should know how to greet the Lord. We should offer obeisances and then we should offer prayers. We should recite. Even if you cannot think of any prayers, then you can always chant the holy name, chant the glories of the Lord, sing the Govinda prayers or something. But we should know how to glorify the Lord, how to worship the Lord. You can recite Purusha Shukta prayers if you know them. So, Lord Ananta Dev is described, he's very pleased with Maharaj Chitra Ketu's prayers. He's very happy. And now he's going to reply to the prayers. And Lord Ananta Dev, he has some things to say. Just to further elaborate on what Maharaj Chitru had, Chitra Ketu was saying, Lord Ananta Dev will expand on it a bit. And he has, he offers. I think there's 11, 11, 11 more verses coming from uh, Ananta Dev, Ananta Shesha, or almost 11 or 9, or maybe 11, I think, yeah. So he describes in text 50, you've, you've taken instruction from Narada and Angira, you've become aware of your transcendental knowledge. You are now educated in the spiritual science. You have seen me face to face. Therefore, you are now completely perfect. So that's very, something very nice to hear. You are completely perfect. It doesn't mean he doesn't need instruction. He still needs instruction. Prabhupada explains, when one is perfect in knowledge, he can develop his love of God through the association of such persons as Narada and Angira. So you may have perfect knowledge, it doesn't mean that you cannot advance. We still have to develop our love for Krishna, our love for God. And Prabhupada quotes this verse about Premanjana Charita Bhakti Lord and the importance of following the instructions of the spiritual master. We must follow the instructions, then one becomes qualified and later sees the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as evinced by Maharaj Chitraketu. Sometimes devotees are very eager to see the Lord. So, the process is you follow the instructions and be patient. One day you will see him. He's certainly there. And we can see him, but we have to purify ourselves. So, Lord Ananta Shesha describes himself. He says, he talks about the, the pranava, the Shabda Brahman, Pranav Omkara is him. And, he said, and then he also said, the deity is also him. There are two for, these two forms of mind, namely transcendental sound and the eternally blissful spiritual form of the deity are my eternal forms. They are not material. So transcendental sound, for us of course we chant the Maha Mantra, but it can also be Omkara. Some people like to chant Om. We don't encourage it, but we chant the holy name. There's more rasa in the holy name than in chanting the Omkara. Although the Omkara is also Krishna, but often people are thinking of Om in an impersonal way. So transcendental sound, important. And also worship of the deity. 
the deity is also the Lord's incarnation. The Lord appears in the form of the deity. Okay, so then it's quite a long purport here in that first text, talking about karma, different activities, vikarma, sinful reactions, intricacies of action, hard to understand, long purport. A little bit from the purport here, Prabhupada said, when one is actually on the platform of vidya, he can personally understand the personality of Godhead in his forms, like those of Lord Rama, Lord Krishna and Sankarshan. So for Maharaj Chitraketu, he is a devotee of Sankarshan, it's another form of the Lord. The Lord has so many forms, he is Anantarup. So, Lord Sankarshan is one of the principal forms of the Lord. And Lord Shiva, he is a devotee of Lord Sankarshan and he comes from Anantashesha. And Lord Anantashesha is in the heart of Lord Shiva. So people can chant Omkara or they can chant Hare Krishna. Prabhupada said they're the same, but of course it will depend on what is the attitude. Some people want to become one, some people thinking oh, this is just for punya karma. Not everybody chants with bhakti, but it's meant that there should be bhakti. Prabhupada quotes from the, the verse Nam Chintamani Krishna Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha Purna Shudo Nichimuktam Binatvam Nama Namino. So Binatvam Nama Namino. No difference between the holy name of the Lord and the Lord Himself. Krishna is His holy name. So chanting the holy name is associating with Krishna. And the deity is also Krishna. Deity is Archa Vigraha. At the request of the devotee, the Lord appears in the form of the deity. So the Lord can appear in so many different forms, in so many different places. So, Lord Anantashesha is instructing Maharaj Chitraketu how everything is the property of the Lord, it's actually meant for His service. Nothing is actually meant for sense gratification. The Lord's energies are eternal and the living entities are also the Lord's energy, they're also eternal. But that doesn't mean that or Prabhupada talks about the Mayavadi philosophy. The Mayavadis, they will worship the Lord's energy. So how do you argue against Mayavadi philosophy? People will say that everything is God. They say this whole material world, this is also God, it's God. We should also worship the, everything, so we can worship everything. It's not different from God. Can we worship Hare Krishna Mahārāj. Yes. How are you going to… Yeah, everyone is not equal to Krishna, right? 
There's one supreme above everyone. That's a verse. Any examples? Krishna Guru Maharaj? Yes. Uh, can we also uh, tell them, Guru Maharaj, that uh, it is one at the same time, it is different. It is simultaneously one and different. So, although it's Krishna's energy, but it still is different from Krishna. So, worshipping the energy will not mean worshipping Krishna directly. Yes. Yes. Yeah, there's a, actually there's a good purport in this section where uh, they contrast the, the Supreme Lord and the living entity. And it compares so many different aspects of the Supreme Lord against the aspects of the living entity. Just like, well, what are some of the qualities of the Lord and how do they compare to the living entities? Can you point out some? Maharaj, the Lord knows every psychic activities of everybody, but the living entities know the activity in their body only. Right. Yeah, that's one. We only know about our own body, but the Lord knows about each and everyone's body. The Lord has a body, Satchidananda, and the living entity's body? Material body. Sir. Material body, miserable body, temporary body, material elements. Right. And the Lord, the Lord is always transcendental, and the living entity is so struggling to become transcendental. Yes? We are coming here by force due to our karma or the Lord is coming by His will. Okay. Yeah, we, are for, we come here, we are forced due to our misuse of independence. But the Lord appears here to deliver us by His own choice. So there are many comparisons there uh, between the Lord and the living entity. So we should understand the difference between the Lord. Just because the Lord has energies doesn't mean that we can worship the energy of the Lord and think it's the same as the Lord. The Lord is a person. The energies are impersonal. Okay, and then that Lord Ananta Shesha goes on to speak about different uh, levels of consciousness. He talks about dreaming and deep sleep and then deep sleep meaning dreamless sleep and dreaming and wakening, different levels of consciousness. And each of these different consciousness have a you have to, we should always remember the Lord. And He's not affected by these different conditions. Prabhupada gives quite a long purport and he talks about how material life, we're so busy, and we get so caught up in our conditioned life, he describes quite dramatically the nature of conditioned life and dreaming 
I dream about bees and tigers and snakes in our dream. They're just simply, it's all, it's all a dream. And so then Prabhupada said, we have a dream at night and at the same time we have a dream in the daytime. And in the daytime the dream is about computers and banks and skyscrapers and so many things, cars and <laughs> so many things, different positions which we're put into. So this is all going on under the direction of the Lord. We have to be careful not to be so much absorbed in this material energy. Ultimately, it's all temporary. What should be remembered is the lotus feet of the Lord. So Prabhupada concludes, Vishmartavya najatu krit. You should never forget the Lord. That's the perfection of life. Then text 55, Lord Ananta Shesha describes himself as the super soul, the supreme Brahman. And we should be fully conscious of him. The knower of everything. And if a living entity thinks himself different from Lord Ananta Shesha, he forgets his spiritual identity of qualitative oneness. So this is wrong. We have to understand our oneness in quality but different in quantity. So Lord Ananta Shesha describes how we become conditioned, we become interested in the bodily expansion, wife, children, material possessions. In this way, by the influence of his actions, one body comes from another and after one death, another death takes place. So Lord Ananta Shesha is describing the conditioning, the danger of the material life, taking birth and dying, staying in the material world, take one birth after another, you never solve the problem of life. So Lord Ananta Shesha is warning all of us, be careful understand the danger, the responsibility of human life. And we're in this position here on the earth planet, it's, it, this is a better position. You go to higher planets, it's much more difficult. So we forget, we forget our position, we forget our responsibility, and we just become absorbed in the material energy. So Prabhupada then, to, oh, ne, the next verse, uh, 58, talks about the value of human life, being born in India, the land of piety. Wow! The land of piety. We don't know how, how pious it is. But it used to be a land of piety. So this is a very valuable birth. So if we take such a birth and we don't make proper use of it, then it's a great waste. He does not understand himself, is unable to achieve the highest perfection even if he is exalted to life in the higher planetary systems. So this of course applies to Maharaj Chitraketu, he became a Vijadara, but that is not perfection. The higher planets, you go there, you can enjoy a long life, very opulent, everybody very good looking and everything so nice, but it's all temporary. You cannot stay there.
So, you have a good birth, you have to make use of it to solve the problem of life. Prabhupada said, when one is perfect, he can render a service for the self-realization of the entire human society. This is the best way to perform humanitarian work. Right? Para upakar. We should do humanitarian work, deliver the world. It's a bit ambitious, you may think, but this is Lord Chaitanya's movement. It's ambitious. We want to save the world from going to hell. How can we just stand by and watch people go to hell? We should try to save them. So then Lord Anantadev glorifies the process of devotional service. If one does do some devotional service, then he can achieve the highest goal of life and he can get free from material desires, he be become situated in transcendence. In text 60, Lord Anantashesha gives an example about the man and the woman how they have so many desires, a husband and wife, they have desires, they're going to make money, they make so many plans, what they're going to do, but because of all their desires, they're never happy. Because, because they made so many plans for sense gratification, so all they get is frustration. They can never be successful. They can never get the peace of mind, the goal of life. So we shouldn't waste our time in making plans for sense gratification, but we should try to plan to become Krishna conscious, make our plan to solve birth and death, get out of the material world. We should give up the desire for trying to enjoy this life or the next life. So Lord Anantashesha is giving instruction like this, there's no better truth than this. Should try to reach the ultimate goal of life. So O King, text 64, Lord Ananta Shesha says, O King, if you accept this conclusion of mine, being unattached to material enjoyment, adhering to me with great faith and thus becoming proficient and fully aware of knowledge and its practical application in life, you will achieve the highest perfection by attaining me. So Maharaj Chitraketu has been given instruction by Lord Ananta Shesha, so fortunate. Of course, Lord Sankarshan or Lord Ananta Shesha gave the instructions and then he goes, he just disappears from that place. And Maharaj Chitraketu is left. So with the instructions, come the responsibility to carry it out. One cannot say, I didn't know. Right? We take the instruction from the spiritual master, spiritual master tells you, I want you to do this. You have to do it. You have to take the order very seriously. If you don't do it, then we're very foolish. Okay, are there any questions on this section? This is Maharaj Chitraketu's prayers.
we heard Maharaj Chitraketu get the mantra. He got this mantra, chanted the mantra for a week, fasting, doing everything necessary. And then he was able to become, after chanting, he became king of the Vijadharas. And then he met Lord Sankarshan and he offers his prayers to Lord Sankarshan. And then Lord Sankarshan gives him instructions also. Lord Sankarshan instructs him about the importance of devotional service and giving up the attachment to sense gratification, material desires. So we'll hear what happens to Maharaj Chitraketu after all of this. We may think, of, we would think if we meet the Lord, problems are over. No more problems, but <laughs> his problems are just beginning, right? He met the Lord. How is, now what's going to happen? He's going to be cursed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's going to have a little bit, something unexpected. So he has to deal with that. We'll see how he responds. It appears, uh, it's described, you know, he, he, travels for quite a long time before he gets cursed. He's been traveling for, it says, millions of years. <laughs> so he was enjoying the material world, traveling in his airplane, going everywhere. But you cannot enjoy forever. The nature of the material world is temporary. No matter what we may have in this life, no matter how comfortable we may be, how com it's all temporary. We have to give it up and we have to prepare to give up this world. We have to get ready for that. This is the Vedic system. The Varnashram system is there. At some point you have to get out from the house or you have to at least mentally detach yourself from the house. Because we have to change the attachment to the Lord, become attached to Krishna and Krishna's service. Nothing else. Give up everything else and just focus on devotional service. That's required. So, Maharaj, uh, sorry, but as female, it is very difficult. We cannot uh, get out of the house. We cannot uh, give up. Well, there are many. There are many ladies who do give it up. You know. You're saying you cannot, but there are many ladies who do. No, Maharaj, not not that I don't want to. But then uh, there are uh, challenges, you know, at home, everybody's concern will not be the same. Mm -hmm. So for, as a, as a female body, we have challenges, Maharaj. Please enlighten. Well, you know, there are so many ladies, elderly ladies in Vrindavan. They come there. They come there to give up their bodies. Yeah, they also have families. They leave their families. Sometimes the family comes with them, sometimes not. But, you know, it's not easy for anybody. But yeah, we've got to, we've got, you've got to make some arrangement to detach ourselves from the material situation. 
internally it, or if you can't if you can't do it externally then you have to do it internally you have to somehow get a little detached from the material situation from the material environment because certainly it's very entangling the children the family the relatives all of these things it's all temporary it's not they're not eternal these relationships are not eternal so even though you're woman doesn't mean that you doesn't mean that you don't have any duties you know I know you have some duties but duty is not just only to the family you see you have a duty to your own self save yourself you have to try to save yourself from the dangers of material life how to do that Anyway, in course of time. Yes, ma'am. It should come about, you know, you, ideally it, it should start to happen from about the age of 50. You see, there should come a point, retirement is there, you see. Not that you work and work and work until you drop, then, then you can't do anything. And you're so, at uh, that point, you're so old, you're so incapacitated, you can't do anything. That's not very good. Thank you, ma'am. Anyway, we're... Krishna consciousness is a preparation for this. We become Krishna conscious, then it helps us to prepare for the next life. We're practicing now in this life. So if your family are not against the, your devotional practice, then it's not so bad. If the family is favorable, if they cooperate with you and they encourage you in your spiritual practice, then it's not so bad. You know. The problem comes if the family are not cooperative. And another problem is just because we're women, because you're in a woman's body, then you think all the time your different duties are there. And you think the duty is to, to care for the children, and then after you care for the children, then you care for the grandchildren. And like, you know, and, then the attachment becomes more and more, you see, the grandchildren and, oh, you know, there's no end to it, you know. So we have to try to just get out at some point, you know, you just have to think it's enough, you know, <laughs> enough, I need to get, need to get free from all of this. Yes, ma'am. And the same is there for the men. It's it's not only the women. The men also. We you know, we see a lot of men working. And then, the and the company they will encourage them. You know, oh, just work another year, do another year, another year, and you know, sixty, and then sixty-five, and then seventy, and they're still working. You know. And then, practically one foot is in the grave by the time they stop working. So, you have to prepare. You have to give yourself time to get out of the material entanglements. Prabhupada said, Dhritarashtras are in every home. So we need Viduras 
Our Krishna consciousness movement is for creating Viduras to go and save the Dhritarashtras. And Dhritarashtra left home, Gandhari also left home. She also, she didn't stay. All right, any other question? Any comment, anybody? Anything? Okay, so next class we'll go on, we'll hear about Chitra Ketu, how he gets cursed, and how he takes it, and how he responds, what he has to say. And we'll hear about Lord Shiva's wife, An interesting chapter. Okay, Srila Prabhupada ki. Jai. Go back to Vrinda ki. Jai. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.